Good morning, good morning, Yaakov. <clears throat> I don't know if the line is choppy. I didn't hear you that clear. It's my earphone thing. That's good. Okay, here you clear. <clears throat> I apologize for not having my camera on. That's but at least now, at least now we learned that uh, some of the Talmudim and the Gemara also, so you know, had some fear of having the Rebbe see them. Yeah. Oh, it's going to get more more about seeing, <clears throat> being seen or seeing. All right. It's really going to be two very easy dots now. <clears throat> With the help of Hashem, we are learning Shkalim Daf Yud Dalid, dedicating this class, Lerifu Shalema to Matilda Basdora. We are going to continue to speak more about some of the 15 offices and officers that were mentioned on the Mishnah Daf Yud Gimel, beginning with Nechunya, the digger of ditches. We're going to have another story of Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair. We're going to have amazing Agadata. We're going to have on the Fudalid Ahmed Bey's a Mishnah that's going to explain how the monies were placed and removed from the various financial chambers that we have in the Bey Samikdash. And then we're going to have in the Mishnah on the Fudalid Ahmed Bey's towards the end, the system, the procedure of how people bought the tokens, like we mentioned, from Yechen and Ben Pinchas, how they redeemed the tokens from Achia, the various... Um, the four tokens that we had, how what each token represented, and as we'll go bekitz at least through the various karbanos, how some of them needed to come with three isorins, a flower, and six loig or a half a hin of oil and another half a hin of wine. Other karbanos came with only two isorins and with four loig of oil and four leg of wine, and then how you had even other karbanes that came with one isodim, and three leg of wine, and three leg of oil, and a lot more. We left off on that yud, gimel, on the base, mamish, at the last line of the Amid. Again, this is one of the uh, 15 officers, connected to one of the 15 offices, someone in charge of making sure that there is ample amount of water, and he was a digger of ditches. So says the Gemara. He was the one in charge of digging ditches and digging caves. And Vuhu Yada, and he knew, turning to Daf Yudalid, Hai Dain Cave Makoir Maya, under which rock will you find cold water? The Hai Dain Cave is Bay Shar Vuve, under which rock are you going to find sources of heat? And in details of the sources of heat, the ad heichan shadveru vuse matia. How far? How far will this uh, source of heat affect its waters? This is something that is called, let's say in English, a water diviner, or other people call it a water witch. And that was something of tremendous importance to make sure that there wasn't a lack of water and noch with the pratim, knowing where to find cold water and where to find hot or warm more waters. Amar Rabbi Eliezer, that in spite of the fact that this Nechunya dedicated his life in making sure that there is plenty of water, but tragically his son passed away and from thirst. And from here you see Amar Rabbi Hanina, that Manda Amar, if anyone says that Rahman of Batron, that Hashem, so to say, is lax, that there isn't a perfect amount of justice. Hashem can overlook mistakes of others. No, says the Gemara, if someone has that attitude, is yis vatron b'nei ma'aye, may his bowels be relaxed. In other words, as we see from the Chunya. Now, truth be told, that many times we, we see people that are not doing the right thing, and it doesn't appear to us that they're being punished. So the vart is, we have to say, that Hashem is slow to anger. Hashem is very patient. But ultimately, Hashem will collect that which is due to him. And actually, that's the meaning of the Pasuk and Tehillim, that 
literally it means that right around godliness, there is a, an extreme turbulence. But here we're darshaning it, that usvivav, that actually those who are closer to God, those that are right around God, nisa'ara, from the word sa'ar, medag dikimoyim kichut asairom. And true, Nechunya was a great it, but there was some sort of lack that he had. And maybe if a person would not have been on such a high level, they would not have been punished. But he was on that high level. And because of the, the lack that he had, he was punished. And actually, he was punished with water that his child passed away from thirst. Now, this is not explaining why the son passed away. That was the another cheshbon. But from the father's perspective, he was, God, so to say, was not a vatron. There was a din and there was a cheshbon. Now, again, obviously, there's tshuva and there's forgiveness. But for whatever his lack was, there wasn't tshuva. And there wasn't forgiveness, and he got punished. Amr Rabbi Yaisi, Loimi Tama said the source for the concept that people that are closest to God are held to a higher standard is not from the Pasik and Tehillim, Elon Min, Madik Sif, from another Pasik, where it says, Vinayruhu, that Hashem is awesome. Al Kal Sivivov, Dafkan, those who are near him, around but near. Moiroi, Alakarevim, Yoisid Min, Har Chaikim. It's amazing that in Hasidus, when we speak about Soiviv Kalalim, we take emphasize. Soiviv is taka higher than the Mali, but Soiviv means that there is a relationship from that level of godliness to the world. Because when it comes to a higher level than Soiviv, you can't call that Soiviv. It's beyond your Kigoi Oi Goa, beyond, beyond. Sivivov here means something that's near relative to others who are more distant. Says the Gemara Rabbi Chagai, in the name of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman. In contrast to this Reb Nechunya, Chayfer Shichin, who had some sort of lack. But on the other hand, Maisev Chasid Echav, that he is this Chasid, Shoye Chayfer, Boireis, Shichin, Oma Aris, Loivrim, Veshavim. His life was dedicated to making sure that people that travel should always have water. And he was a Tzadik, and he was a Chasid. In Pamachas, Hoysev Bito Yiveris, Lihinose, and there was a time that while his daughter was going to her own wedding, that a tragedy appeared to happen. There was a rush of a river that swept her away, and people thought that she drowned. And everyone was coming to meet the father. And they were trying to console him, but he refused to be consoled. He found it unjust because he had no sin. And in Nachdafke, he was the one that provided people with water, so water should destroy his, his family. All Rav Pinchas Benyar Legabe. And Rav Pinchas Benyar also boyi menachamte, but velikibol aloy misnachamo. But he did not receive consolement. And Rav Pinchas Benyar understood that there was a reason why he's not feeling consoled. Now, Hashem makes a gzeda, that when a person, God forbid, has a tragedy, they have a certain koyach, we should not say they have a koyach to, to handle it. But from Gamla, Shachna, we should never know that, and we should be compassionate. But Rav Pinchas Benyar felt that the way this Yid was not accepting consoling must mean that maybe his daughter never passed away. And indeed, Amalain, and he began to acquire about this person that Dain, who Chasid Chain, this is the one that you're calling your Chasid, tell me about him. And Amrulay, they told him, Rebbe, yeah, they told Rav Pinchas Benyar that Kach Bekach Choya Oisa. That this was taking his life. He was making sure that everyone had water. And they themselves told Rav Pinchas and Kach Bekach Idolei, like, where's justice? How can it be that that his that water drowned his child? Omar, and indeed Rav Pinchas agreed with, the, with that. And he said, that there's a yid that honors God Almighty with water. And Hashem cut him down through water. Now, Pinchas Binyad protested against that, and Yad Nafla Havara, and after he made that statement, a rumor reached them, Be'ir, that what? That boss, Bitishol Oisa Ha'ish, that she indeed emerged from the water. So even before they actually saw her, right after he made that fila, right away they found out that indeed she never passed away to begin with. What happened? Either is the Amre that the Suhta Isra is that she was saved by catching onto a branch. The, the Amri and other people say that Malach Yorad Kedemus Rav Pinchas Benyoyer, that a Malach appeared in the form of Rav Pinchas Benyoyer and Vihitzila and saved and saved her. And how many Hasidish stories do we have 
with various of Aaron Abayim and with many other tzaddikim, that the Chassid was saved, they saw the Rebbe saved them. Manish. And that's the, we see over here, that when something good has to happen, a Malach takes the form of the tzaddik and saves that Yid. Moving on. The next officer in the Mishnah was Givine, right? That was his name. And he was the Cruz. The Cruz in Yiddish, he was the Veker. And as the Gemara reminds us, we had the Samtamid, Shohayamachas with Vesamigdash, that he would announce and he would cry out in the Holy Temple. And Mahoya Oimer, how did he wake up those who were there? Now, obviously, no one slept in the Azara Azara, but as also we will repeat, we will hazard that we had an area called the base Hamoikat, which was really a dormitory. A part of it was a, a dormitory. Base Hamoikat means that there was a huge fire in the room, making sure people in there sleep in a warm environment, people actually during the day when it was too cold to walk around the whole time outdoors, barefoot, sometimes even in the snow in Yerushalayim or in the freezing cold, they would warm themselves up in there. But what would he announce? Ah, and I'm sure many of us heard this expression in Yiddish, how to wake up. And says the Gemara that I grief us hamelach shama koil ad ches parsois. That Agrifas the king was once around, this is eight parsois, is anywhere between 18 or 20 miles away, and he heard the voice of the Veker, and he was so happy that he gave him a lot of matanis. When I saw him, he was impressed by the fact when he woke up people, Hebra, you had no option other than getting out of your, whatever you slept on the bench over there, right, to go serve God Almighty. The next member, the next officer was Ben Gever. And he was in charge. Now, really, the Gemara, we have to just fill in the lines over here, in Mesech the Siyuma. So when the Gemara is speaking about the first avoid of the morning, was they made the first lottery, which coin will be Zeichah to run up the Mesbeach, to run up the ramp, and to do the Truma Sadeshim. And who was the one that announced regarding the avoid of the Truma Sadeshim? So you have over there, you have the calling of the Gavra. So now we want to interpret exactly what does that mean. So Tir game Rav, when Rav was serving as the Maturgaman in front of the Shiva of Rav Shilo, he taught that the words over there in Yuma about the Karagavra, Karagavra means Achris Karaiza, that there was an announcement made. He taught the word Gavra, an announcement that now was the time to make the lottery for the Truma Sadeshan. However, um, 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 Arley, so they tell Rab or Amrun, um, if it was the whole yeshiva of Rab Shila, that no, maybe the meaning over there in Yuma about the Cruz Gavra is not that there was a proclamation made by a person, but maybe Gavra means a rooster, right? And maybe it means that whenever they heard the rooster calling, that is when they began the avoida of making the lottery of the Truma Sadeshin, that Emoid say, Maybe that's the meaning over there in Yuma. So to which Rav respond, and now we see why we brought it over here. In Shkolin, no, because we learned in our Mishnah that one of the officers in the Beis Amigdash was Ben Gever. Here for sure, Gever cannot mean a rooster, because Islach Lameimot Bar Tarnagoyla? Of course not. So Gever is the name of a person whose job is to be a crier, to be a vecker, to be someone who calls out as to what the avoida now, as to what needs to get done right now. The next member, the next officer that's mentioned in the mission is Ben Beivai, and he was in charge, Al Hapokia on the wicks. And as we explained, that the size of the of the lamps in the Menorah were all the same, and they held a half a log of oil. And the reason why they had that size is because in the longest winter night, they needed the half a log of oil to last from when they lit the Menorah late in the afternoon all the way until the morning. Question is, what happened in a summer night when the night was much shorter? And we never set up a, 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 an avoida in which there's going to be a tremendous amount of waste. So what happened there was is that they made the wicks much thicker. And there was a chachma to that. In other words, the oil was the same. If the nights are shorter, you make the wicks thicker. When the nights were longer, you make the wicks uh, skinnier, thinner. And this office was ran by Ben Bevai. Shahoya Mizayeg he would adjust the thickness of the psilois of the wicks. Says the Gemara that Rabbi Yossi once went Lukufra, name of a place. 
and Bo Memanya Alein Parnasin, and he wanted to appoint people to be in charge of a certain type of communal job, and they felt that this job is not that important. That like it wasn't, it wasn't something that was very difficult. There was no big yichus over there, and therefore Bolikim Luminon, they didn't accept it. So all Amar, so he went up and he said in front of them that look in our Mishnah that they made an office in the base of Middash led by Ben Bebai Alapokia. And they made a whole big thing about it. It's also no big deal. And that's to teach you that Ama Imzer Shenesmana Al Hapsilois. That's all he did relative to other offices. It was a very uh, easy and not that important job. And if you would get the wicks wrong, Nishkaferlach, nevertheless, Zachar Limonis Imgadoyle Hadoid, he's listed together with the other offices. And some of them, wow, are very, what we would consider very important uh, communal uh, of offices. So Atam Sha'atam Nisman Al Khaina Fasha is he was giving them some sort of um oversight over over maybe feeding the poor, over maybe security, which is all related, you can say, to the fashis, a lot more important than making sure that the wick is thick or thin. So like culture that it is something of tremendous significance. In other words, any Oisik Bitsar Khitzibur, whatever it is that a yid is doing, is very, very important. And never should one feel this is like, so to say, beneath my dignity. It's not worth my time, God forbid. Ben Arsa was the one in charge, Al Hatzilzel, on the symbols. And Kihad the Taninan, as we learned in Tamid, that when the Kayan or the Kayan Gadol over there would bend over to pour the wine of the, of the Nasachim. So then the deputy Kayan Gadol was there and he watched him about to pour the wine. And then Hainif Asgan and he would lift up the flags. And when the flag was lifted, that is when the Hikish ben Arza Alatzilzal, that is when he hit the symbols. That was the first sound that was made by the Levium and followed immediately by all of the other Levium, as mentioned there in Tamid, the different instruments, the minimum amount of number of them playing music and of them singing, right, the songs which all began with the Ein Shira El Alayayin when they began to pour the Nesachim. Hugras Ben Levi was in charge on singing itself. Omar, so there was the there was the instruments and he was in, in charge of the song. Omar Abacham, regarding this Hugras, Ne'ima Yisei Rehoyso Yodeya, he was exceptionally melodious. For Omru, all of them, and they said, on Al Hugras Ben Levi, that Shehoyimanim Eskoy Lebezemer, that he had such a pleasant voice when he would sing, and and there were times that in order for him to change the, the projection of his voice, he would stick his thumb in his mouth. And by putting his thumb in his mouth, he, he created all different types of, of, of musical notes, a certain chachma that he had. And and it was not only beautiful, but it was so overwhelming that his that the Kaihanim would simply jump jump back by being overwhelmed by the by the neimos of this yid's voice. It's interesting that they're mentioning how the levy while singing would be using his thumb, and as we have another chazal that when we were taken into into Babel, how the levim bit off their thumbs for them not to be forced to play musical instruments in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Nor here you see, it wasn't only, a thumb is not only used, you know, when you play a flute, it's also used, somehow they used it when they were singing, when they were singing uh, with their voices, that he would use his goidel to help the voice be projected in a more beautiful way. Beis Garmu, they were in charge, al maise lechem apanam, I'm making the lechem apanam bread that was baked every Friday, that was replaced on the shulchan every Shabbos, says the Gemara, that Beis Garmu, the Sabraisa, this family had a secret which enabled them to make the lechem upon them the way it should be made. Not only in the making of it, but even more, another step of their knowledge was when they would remove it from their molds. See, the lechem upon them was shaped in a very unusual way. And it would be shayach that even if you know how to bake it properly, breaking something properly means not that the outer part should get burnt and the inner part should, should remain doughy. But even if everything is properly baked, removing it from its mold that kept it in that interesting, let's say, U shape, many another person would have the bread crumble or crack or break. They knew both how to bake it properly and how to remove it from its mold. But the this technique they never taught to anyone else. 
And Sholchu Chachamim, because of they were upset. Why didn't you teach it to other peoples? You're keeping this knowledge in your family. So they went and they view Umanim Alexandria and they founded Alexandria in Egypt, people that were also expert bakers. Shahoy became a Maiselechem upon him and they hired them. And Taka, they knew how to bake the bread in a way where all of it gets properly baked. However, but they did not have that additional technique how to remove it from its molds in a perfect way, making sure the lechem upon them remain wholesome. And the Gemara tells us that they, or the Braisa tells us, they's garmu. First of all, they knew how to warm up the bread inside of the oven, or they would first heat up the oven for it to hit a certain temperature and only then place the bread. These are all steps in making sure that when the bed bread is baked, it's baked, it's baked through and through, and not the outside is properly or overly baked, and the inside remains raw. And also, when they took it out of the molds, they took it out dafka once the mold was removed from the oven. And because of these two steps, and they knew the, the Gemara is not telling us exactly the details of it, but they knew both when to put the bread in and exactly when and how to remove it from the mold. Number one, the bread would never spoil. It would never spoil because it was perfectly baked. The Elu, however, those people that they hired from in Alexandria, they tackle also knew the first step, they knew how to first warm up the water oven and then to place the bread in there. But but they only knew how to take it out of its mold also when it was still inside the oven. And because of that, the bread would turn moldy. Now it's amazing. There were miracles that happened with the Lechem upon him that we speak about that it remained smoking hot the whole time. Right, and when they used to bring out the Shulchan Apanim on Yom Tev for people to see these miracles. So with a miracle, everything was good and fine. It's the Chmashma that sometimes you were not always Zoycha to the big miracle. And, um, and and the bread not only did not remain smoking hot, but it would get moldy. Or there was like a miracle that it remained warm, but at the same time, at the same time, it got more, it got it spoiled. And Kivun Shiyad Chacham and Bedavar Hazer, that that they were upset at the base garmu for them not sharing this technique. But they, but 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 they knew they knew something that no one else did. So Amru they said, call that this knowledge has to be used in the service of God, as it says, Koil Poil Hashem that everything that Hashem does is for his own sake. So this wisdom has to be used out. Actually, the Alter Rebbe and Tanya Pedig Chavzayin quotes the Pasik, but he focuses on the continuation, which could be connected to our Sugi here, where the Pasik says, V'gam l'rasha l'yoyim ra'a. Alter Rebbe is speaking about the beauty of the Avoid of Abenini, right? You have the sweet the foods, and then you have sharp foods, and how the uh, how Davka, a person who's a Rasha, when he or she does Shuva, that l'yoyim ra'a, that the bad gets transformed into good. There was some sort of transformation over here, as we'll see, and that is that Sholchu Achreim. So they sent to get back to do a tshuva to call back the base Garmu. But Veleiratzu Lavi, they says, listen, you guys fired us. You're on your own. Until the temple needed to commit to pay double what they were paid until now. Either until now they were paid originally Yud Beis Mana, Hoyanoitlam guys, the first medium sized line, and now. To get them back, we needed to pay them 24. Rabbi Huda says that Lechatchila, they got paid 24 mana, and now they were paid 48. Bottom line is, is that uh, the technique was used in, in the service of Hashem, koil poil Hashem lemaneyu. And not only that, but we discovered that it wasn't even wrong for them not to share the wisdom. Because Amru Lahen, we asked them again, Amru Lahen. The reason why we're not sharing this technique with anyone is because we have a tradition from our forefathers, Shabbayas, Azad, that this holy house, Asad, Licharev, will get destroyed. And we don't want for this knowledge to be known because then others will be taught. And after there will be a Churban Abayas, it's God forbid possible. It's ultimately going to be used in the service of an Abayi And Bachlal, as we know, you go today to the Avi Avay Satuma there in Rome, right, to the Catholic Church, how, how they copy, they make buildings that copy the dimension of the Beis HaMikdash. And many things that they do, La Avay Zara, which is Yashka, which is Avay Zara, they do Mamish the Avay they copy from the Beis HaMikdash. So we made sure this family, actually, we discovered it wasn't even a negative thing. 
that they kept the wisdom in the family for it never to go and be used for Avayda Zodim. Now, the Chachamim did not agree with them. The Chachamim were upset with them. They rehired them because still they were the best. Even though the Chachamim were not pleased by the fact that they never shared this wisdom, how to bake bread with others, but still they did acknowledge other good things that this family had, which is that bedvarim halalu, at least for other things, maskirim oison lishvach, do we mention bezgarmu, even the Chachamim praised them. And which is, that they never, ever allowed for any family member, even a child, to have the same type of bread made from fine flour for no one to suspect that they took any of the dough of the Beis Amigdash. So their family never ate whole bread, which is and this, which is inferior. No one should suspect them. And now we have something very similar with Beis Aftinas, the family of Aftinas. They were in charge of making the ketoidas. They compounded the ketoidas that was compounded once a year that we also learned details not that long ago, right? Every year, 368 mana, and every 60 or 70 years, there was an accumulation of when it hit 184, then that year they only made half that amount. So here's again, says the Brai Social Base of Tinas, they were experts in compounding the incense. And not only that, but aside of the Yud Aleph Samanim or Samimanim, there was other, there was something else added to it known as the Ma'ale Oshon. Ma'ale Oshon literally means that which makes the smoke go up in a perfectly straight column. Now, the grass or the herb that produces, that adds in the incense, this, this nature, that it should, when it's burnt, it should go up in a perfectly straight column. That was something that no one knew where, what, what that grass is. And also, like Beis Garmu, they didn't tell anyone how to make it, how to make it, especially not how to add, how to find, and how to put in this mala Oshan. And the, the way we say it in the Pitta Martyrs, Umala Oshan Kol Shehu. It wasn't about quantity, but it was it was a power that this grass, this herb had, that it gave that additional beauty to the mala asha, to, to the katoidus. And so same thing. So they they told the base of Tinas, you have the schus to make the katoidus. You have to share the wisdom with all of us. Everyone should know how to do it. And they never taught it. And because of that, Sholchu, they went and they found other experts again back in Egypt. Sholchu, they view Uman in Alexandria, Shomitzrayim. And they were taka bikiyam in how to make the pitam artritis. That in itself is a chachma. How to compound it properly. However, ubamala ashan loyoyah bikiyam. And therefore, shal beis aftinas, the artritis that was made from the family beis aftinas, hoysam mis, misam meres vo'oyla kamakele, would first grow up, go up, mamish, like a stick. So you just imagine that. The artritis was burning on the mezbeach apnim, on the mezbeach hazov. And there was this skinny, narrow, straight column of smoke that's going until the roof. And only when it hit the roof, there, Upoisa Viodetis, would it spread out. So it first spread out, Mamish, on the whole roof. And it was, when there was no more room for it to spread out horizontally, then it would go down vertically on the walls. You can just imagine that. It was like, wow, it was like a mystical feeling in there. So you have this one column going up. And, and, and it didn't spread out. It hit the roof and it spread on the roof, it like stuck onto the roof, and then it went down the walls. However, Vishal Elu, the katoidus that was made from the, uh, from the professionals, from Alexandria of Mitzrayim, this, the, the, the compounding was done properly. The scent was the way it should be. But it didn't go up perfectly straight. It would already start spreading out before it hit the roof. And Kivin Shiyadu Chacham Medavar, so Amru, Kol Ma'ashevar HaKadosh Baruch Hu the knowledge of the Malo Oshin has to be used in the service of Hashem. And as it says, here we have one passage from Yeshaya, or Nusach HaCheres in the parentheses, and even though they, they felt that the base of Tinas is, right, but we have to use there, we have to use it for the good. Same, same thing happened again. Either Yud Beis Manoha and now they only uh, agreed to re- get rehired the Nosnu Lehem Chavdalit. 
Rabbi Huda says, Chavdalet Hoya Noitle in the Nuslim and Memches. And here again, Amru Lahem and Pnei Ma Ein Atam Noitzim Lalame. So Amru Lahem, Mesoyer Sibi Yodenim Avoy Seno. Shabayas Azeh Asid Licharev. And Shalayilmudu Achedim, the Yu Oisim Kain Lifnei Avoy Gazara Shalahem. Now that is what they felt. Initially, the Chachamim disagreed with them. But even though they were upset by the fact that they did not teach, uh, the, the, this additional mala ashan, but they still acknowledge another good quality that they had. The dvarim halolu for something else, maskirim oisim lishvach, which is shelo yotzos isha michel echad mihem mivusemes miolam that never would a woman from the family of avtinas go out on the street wearing perfume. Now, just to understand that people wore perfume then a lot more than today. Today, a person, because of, you know, because of plumbing, we have water, people are clean. People wear perfume and a, an add-on. There, the way people were able to stand in the Daladamas of another was only because people wore perfume. It's what we call a French bath or something like that. People had a terrible body odor. They bathed once a week or once a month or in France. I don't know if they ever bathed. And then to make sure to think, to camouflage the bad smell, they would add some in. And yet, the woman there never wore psalmin for no one to suspect that they took anything from the Beis HaMikdosh. And that if there was someone that married out of the family, people married in the families, uh, halachically. So an uncle, a niece, that's a mitzvah, or cousins. But if someone married from, a, from another group, they would make up that the condition of marriage, almanas, that you should never wear perfume out there for there never to be the slightest of a suspicion that they took from the Ketoyos of the Beis HaMikdosh. Like we just had. Some very heavy Gemaras over here. That just to point out how the Chachamim were very upset with that family for a very long time. For them not teaching the the, the 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 way how to make a traitors that pamacha so you see oimim biyushalayim umatzasi tin like echad I found a youngster from the house of Avtinas and I omar ti loy bni meize mishpacha at so amar li me mishpacha as poloni and poloni is from base Avtinas omar ti loy that bni listen here abisecha your your forefathers lafish and eskabnu l'rabis kavoy done. The Chachamim felt that they're not sharing how to make the Ketoyres and adding the Malo Oshan, so to say, to give more covet to their family. It wasn't the Kavit Shemayim, it was for their own covet. Ulamayit Kavit Shemayim, so Rabbi Yossi is telling the Tinuk, you can argue, what did the Tinuk do wrong? Rabbi Yossi is telling him, because of that, Kavitim Nesmai, or Kavit Shemayim Nesrava. You have to know in what tone he told it to him. He was just pointing out to him the importance of uh, foregoing your own covet for the greater Kavit Shemayim. Another story, Amar Abakiva, Sachli Shimon ben Luga, that once Malaka to Yisi Yasovim, I was gathering herbs and grasses, who, me, Ani, and the Tinuk Echad, Mishal Beis Aftinas, right four or five lines before the bottom of the Amid, and the Yisi Oisa, and I noticed this youngster, that at first he cried, Shabacha, and then the Yisi Oisa, Shesach, like I saw him laughing, Amar Teloi Bini, Lama Bachisa, so Amar Li, Al Kavoy Beis Amo, I'm crying because of the glory of our family. Shana Smite was diminished. This is after the Khurban. The Lama Sahakta, why are you laughing? Omar Li. So he told me this is all what this child told Shimon Ben Luga, who repeated it to Rabakiva. Al Kov Alakovaid Hamasukan Lat Sadikim La Asid Lovai. Ah, I'm laughing because the covet is going to come back. In other words, this family never taught how to properly make the Ketoiris with all the details, which means that La'asid Lavai, when Mashiach is going to come, who will be entrusted with the making of the Ketoyres? It's going to come back to the base of Tinas. Umar Isa asked this uh, Shimon ben Loigo, what made you think about that? So he told me, Mala Oshan Lenegdi, we just walked by the Mala Oshan. So, 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 so the Shimon ben Loigo tells him, oh good, show me which one is it. Bini Hareuli, can you please show me? It's right around here. Omar Loy and this child still did not did not spill the beans. He told me, Rabbi Mesoyres biyadei ab meavoys biyadei meavoysay shaloy laharoysay leberia. That's the gear. Not not to show it to anyone. And here again, uh, up until now, in the beginning, they were not happy with that. Omar Rabbi Yechonah Benuri. We're going to skip the parentheses. 
or we can go with the Pramalaki Dani Asavim Aniv Zakan Echad or Pogan Bi Zakan Echad Mushal Besaftinas. And this elder had on Wigila Samanam Biyodi. He had a scroll. Today it's a common thing to have a picture book. Then it was a big yichas. So someone drawed out the, the, the images, the pictures, the paintings of all different types of herbs and the name that the trader gives to each one. And from there, you know, the Yud Al of Samanim, there there was a picture of the Malo Oshon, and this Zakein gave it to Rabbi Yechen and Menuri. And Omar Li, and he tells Rabbi Yechen and Menuri, Rabbi, you should know that Lisha'abar Hoyo Beis Abot Sunuyim, that they were very discreet. They never shared this with anyone if he was not part of our family. And Vahoyu Daf Yud Dalid Amit Beis, Moistrim Es Amagila Hazois, Elu La Elu, they only would pass this book. One to another family member. But Va'achshav now, She'ein Beis Abba Nemanim, this Zakin felt that Beis Aftinas should no longer be entrusted with the secret because they might teach it to someone unworthy and God forbid the Goyim will use this for their Avodah Zara. So he actually broke the external family tradition, which is not to share how this is made. The tradition was really kosher the whole time. It was for the Goyim never to get hold of this. But when he when he saw that his family is no longer worthy, so then he gave it to Rabbi Echenan ben Nuri. And he tells him, but Now you be careful, it should not fall in the wrong hands. So that was Megala, that it wasn't that the family only wanted to keep the knowledge in their family for their covet. Now this was Megala that the fact that they were such akshanim and they never shared it with anyone up until this point was always l'kvayt shamayim. So ukshabasi v'hirtseisi advarim l'fnei rabakiva. Now he changed his whole opinion. Zogu ein of the mice. His eyes filled with tears and l'chayet filled with tears because rabakiva was very judgmental on Amadalif. Now rabakiva discovered that it was wrong to be so judgmental on them. And he says ma'ata ein onu tzadichim l'haskidom lignai. As we mentioned, that we're going to have in Yuma two Mishnais, one after the other. You have to know how to read the, the end of the Mishnais. Zechir Tzadik Lebracha, V'Shem Yisharm Yirkav. And one shot was that includes the family of Aftinas, that they were mentioned, Lignai, because they never shared the information. Now Rabbi Kiva discovered that they actually, at the end, they gave it to another family. They gave it to Rabbi Yechen and the Nuri. So the, during the hundreds of years that they shared it with no one was only to be Marba B'Kvay Shemayim, as we said, that they knew that the Beis Amigdash will be destroyed, and this part of the Avoida indeed never came to the hands of those who took from us, who stole from us the Avoida for the Beis Amigdash, and it remains something uniquely to be used, as will happen with the imminent building of the third Beis Amigdash. Elazar was in charge on the curtains, says the Gemara, meaning that you needed to weave the curtains. And we'll learn more details about we already learned together. We'll learn again. Uh, there was there were there were really there were thirteen curtains. There was especially the curtains that separated the kodesh and the kachim kachim. Bechule, Pinchas, the final office that we have on Daf Yud Gimel was Pinchas Hamalbish. Hamalbish means let's call this a uh, a uh, a a a clothing valet. In other words, he he was a dresser. In all of the high end stores today. You don't just buy a garment and you pay thousands of dollars. But the Chachma there is to know how to make that garment perfectly fit you. And Maisa B'Koy Nechad, just to point out the Chashibus of Takin knowing how to make garments properly fit here on the Kohanim G'daylim, and many people hold on all the Kohanim. You know, they had general sizes, but then it was custom tailored for each one, especially by the Koin Gadol. Maisa B'Koy Nechad, Shahil Bish Le'is that he once dressed a officer, a Roman officer, and he did such a good job that the that the officer paid this client that 12 coins he gave him. These are golden coins. All this is Araya, that this type of service is of tremendous significance. So to say, explaining why we gave this a standalone office known as the office of Pinchas Hamal Beis. Now we're going to go on in Halacha Beis, and this Mishnah is speaking about the Lishkois in which money was placed. And people made vows 
whether a chedim vow, whether an erech vow, whether a damim vow, whether a donation to the better kabayis, and there was a whole system how the money was placed and removed from this chamber. Ein poichasin mishiva aram koilin. There was never less than seven supervisors that were on top of the three treasurers, the three gizbarim that actually put the money in and took the money out. So the gizbar was the name of the final officer, the, the gizbar, the treasurer. Again, he, he put the money in, he took the the Mishnah says, as we'll see, that all officers, this is not only for money, we'll see, that ultimately we want to have at least two people in charge, checks and balances. And the only exception was, going back to the Mishnah, Daf Yud Gimel, Ben Achia, who was in charge, like we mentioned, Sha'al, he was like the head of the doctor's um, office, and he stood by himself. Many people worked for him, but he was like the CEO. There wasn't a co-CEO and a lozer, only these two offices, says the Mishnah, were led by one officer because the, the people accepted that it should be only one person. But in all other offices, the people wanted for the rule of and as the Gemara goes on with more details, from Gimel Gizbarim, and our Mishnah mentioned that atop uh, the overseers of the Gizbarim were these supervisors, and they're called Aram Koilin. So we learned in Abraisa that the Aram Koilin, they worked who oversaw the overseers, who looked over the supervisors. So there was a higher office, Katalikin. See where the Gagoyim got their name from? Catholics. That's that's the name of the uh, the overseers over the supervisors. And even they were two and not one. And Hadohu Dechsev, like it says in Divrei Hayomim, and we're going to go through the names. First, we're going to go through the Gizbarim. Then we're going to have the names at that era of the Aram Koilin. And then we're going to see the two Katalikin. So Yechiel and Uziu and Nachas, they were the three Gizbarim. On top of them, the, then you had, again, supervisors were on top of the Gizbarim. And the names of the Gizbarim at, of the Aram Koilam at that time was Asoel, Yirimiois, Yirimiois, the Yizavad, the Eliel, the Yismachi Yahu, and Omachas, Ubino Yahu, that seven, they were known as the Aram Koilam. And they were Pkidim in the hands of, and now we're going to learn about the Katalikin, who was then called Koinen Yahu. And Shimi, who were brothers, Katalikin, and even the Katalikin also had someone over them. And who was over them? They were Bemifkat, they were in the service of, they were appointed by Yechizkiyo HaMelech and Ba'azar Yahu, who was Negid, base Elohim, which means he was the Koin Gadol. And they called him the Negid of the house of God. And under the Vetter, HaMelech the Koin Gadol. means all the way up until the top, you had this duality of overseers when it comes to communal, when it comes to communal affairs. And now we're going to go back to the treasury. So Kishuhu Chaisam, whenever, whenever they would place money in this chamber and making sure that it's properly closed and sealed. So again, the one, the hands-on, the foot soldier was the Gizbar. Hagizbar Chaisam. But when he sealed that door, and the Aram Koyal put a seal over the seal of the Gizbar. Not all seven of them, one of the seven. And the Aramko then would give over the seal to the Katalikon. And the Katalikon would make another seal. And he would pass the seal up to the Koin Godel. In other words, to get into the chamber, you needed to break through various seals. Then the Koin Godel was Chaisim. I'm sorry, and he gave it to the Melech. Now, when they needed to remove money from these chambers, so the king needed to make sure that his seal was not broken. So Amelech Roya Chaismoi, and when he saw that his seal was not broken into, the king was the one that was matted. Then the king Godel Roya Chaismoi matted, Katlikin Roya Chaismoi matted, Aram Kol Roya Chaismoi matted, Gizba Roya Chaismoi matted. And if there was a poor person that needed to eat, never Chay would he have to wait. So there was a whole system: how the money went in, how the money went out. And as the Mishnah says that Ein Oisin Shurara Alatzibur B'Mamay. Oh, here it's clear. I'm sorry. In the Mishnah, the Girs and the Gemara was when it comes to money matters, you needed to have no less than two people. 
no less than two people. And Rav Nachman B'Shem Rav Mana says, where do we get that from? Al Shem, Vehem, Yikhu, they in the plural, they should take the gold, the Tcheles, the Argaman, etc. Amar Rav Chama, Bei Rav Chanina, the son of Rav Chanina. And we're speaking here about the importance of having people overseeing the accounts. For uh, ultimately, it's even to the benefit of the gizbert for no one to suspect the gizbert. And and the lead up to that is that you should know that luchais from the remnants of the luchais hashir moishu moishu rabbeinu became wealthy. Hadodukset, as it says in the pasuk, that when it comes to the second tablets themselves. They were not, or their, their origin was not celestial as were the first, but God told Moshe Psal Lecha that you should, I mean, the Luchas, when they were placed together, they were a pure, a perfect cube, right? We have this in Baba Basra, right? Three, six Tvachim by six Tvachim by six Tvachim, when they're both together. Shnei Luchas, Abanim Psal Lecha, Psal Lecha, Shnei Luchas, Abanim, Nukuda, meaning that Psal Lecha, why Lecha? So carve out, hew out, make sure that it's perfectly squared. No, God told Moshe Rabbeinu that the fragments of the sapphire that's being, so to say, hewn off, cut off, making these stones perfect as they should be, have tremendous value. God gifted that to Moshe. And you have an Abchanan that says another source of Moshe Rabbeinu's wealth, that that an entire quarry, an entire treasure of precious stones and pearls, or gila, or baruch that in the tent of Moshe Rabbeinu, he discovered a source of tremendous wealth. All of this, it's important when you have a Moshe Rabbeinu that's extremely wealthy, it makes him, so to say, less vulnerable, right, as to a person who's in charge, who, God forbid, is impoverished, who needs the financial support, it puts him in a more vulnerable position. The point of this is, is that we know that Moshe Rabbeinu, we know where he became wealthy from. And yet we will see that there were people that suspected that Moshe Rabbeinu stole money. And all of that is to emphasize the importance of having a system where there is more than one person in charge of the treasurer in order for for there not to be able to be a suspicion. And as it says, and they, they would look. They were looking after Moshe, and on that we have today Amri Royin Chadomar that the looking, the gazing at Moshe was lignai and Chadomar l'shvach. Man the armor lignai when they were looking at Moshe Rabbeinu walk. Look, imagine they would say that Chamun Shakin. Look at his thick shoiks. Look at his thick thighs. Chamun Karan. Look at his thick legs. Chamun Kupa. Look how fat he is. Look how much he eats. And where does he get all that money from? He takes, he took it from us. He lives off the communal fund beyond the needs. Everything that he has is and, and even though we know that he was wealthy by himself from the psoilas, from that, from the treasure that he found in the UC, but they suspected him. All of that is just showing out how the treasurers should make sure that they should be beyond suspicion. Not everyone says that they looked at him in a negative way. You know, that machamet sadikayo mezaki. How great is it to have this chos to look at the tzaddik? You know, it's people looked at Moshe because of their understanding how it's important Pasha, to look at a tzaddik. And they would say that when he would walk to his tent. So before he would walk, they would gather each other and say, let's have the merit to look at him. After he entered his tent, they would say, how lucky were we, how fortunate were we that we looked at Moshe Rabbeinu. So not the Hibitu was only Lignai, but there was also a Gnai. And all of that is explaining why we have this Klal, that you don't appoint any people, especially in charge of money matters, that the person should be, so to say, be, that the person should have the only access to the account Many Moises, they talk, I have two people that sign on checks, right? You have two people, all of that comes from this mission. Okay, so now, for some reason, even though the Gemara, the Gemara went through many of the 15, and the final one was Pinchas HaMalvish, now the mission is going back to the first two. So on that Yud Gimel, the first two was Yechenad and Pinchas sold the seals, or the tokens, and Achia 
would therefore exchange the tokens for the Nasachim. Now, it's very simple. The details, just to speak it out once, we spoke about by the intro, there were three different types of measurements of flour, wine, and oil that came with various carbonates. And really, it had to do not with the name of the carbon, whether it's a chatas, whether it's an oil, whether it's an asham, whether it's a shlamim, but it had to do with the type of animal that you were bringing. If the animal came from cattle, and we'll see pratim, it wouldn't make a difference whether it was a calf, whether it was a, a, a you know ox or cow within the year, or when they got older in the second year, when it's an eagle, when it's a pata. So then those karbanis that needed to come along with nesachim would have the largest amount of nesachim. And when it comes to flour, it's going to be three three esroinim, three esroinim. And when it comes to the oil and the wine, it would be a half a hin. A hin was made out of 12 loig. A half a hin is six loig of oil and six oil of wine. That was the largest amount of the nesachim. Then you had karbanos that came from a ram, which is a male sheep, an adult. An adult means... Third, beyond 13 months, older than 13 months, that would come with two esroinim. We say this many times in the davening if you pay attention. And then when it comes to the oil and to the flour, to the to the oil and to the and to the uh, wine, that would be a third of a hin, which is four leg, four leg and four leg. And then animals that were a goat, and we'll see many others included in that category. They came with the least amount of nesachim. That came with only one isar on a flower and three loig of oil and three loig of wine. These are the three types. Now, there was one category, which was the metzoida. And in Pratim, the Torah speaks about it explicitly in Parshas metzoida, that if the metzoida can afford at the end of his procedure of becoming pure, he would have to bring three karbonais, three animal karbonais, one for an oila, one for a chatas, chatas, oila, and asha. If the Mitzvah was poor, then the oila and the chatas, or the chatas and the oila was substituted with, with birds, but he would always have to bring the animal for an asham. Now, this animal came with the three and three. It was the smallest type. It came with three leg of oil, or three leg of wine, but the Mitzvah needed an additional leg, an additional leg of of uh, oil, if you remember, because that oil was used to place on the cartilage of his right ear and on his th- thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot. So there was a fourth leg of oil. Oh, now let's read inside the Mishnah. There were four types of tokens. And the four categories, one of them, it said eagle, which is a calf. On the other one, it said zacher. Zacher is this ram. A ram, again, is a, is a male. Shepsala that's not with Ben Shana, it's not a pilgus, never a pilgus should be brought within the 13th month, but it's beyond, it's older than the third, it's from 14 months and on. The third one was a Gedi, was a goat, and then there was a standalone one for the Chaita, meaning for the Metzayda, because he needed to have not the three log of oil, which was needed for the animal, but a fourth log for that whole avoid of smearing it on parts of his body. Then as he said, no, that hey, that there was a fifth seal, and as we'll see, the fourth and the fifth were both for Mitzrayim, but according to Ben Azai, there was one Chaisim for the wealthy Mitzrayim, and there was one Chaisim for the poor Mitzrayim, as we'll learn more details in the Gemara. Now, another, another detail in which Ben Azai argues with the Tanakhama, that what was written on the Chaisamais was not the words Egel, Zach, Gedi, and Chaitim, which are in Lashon HaKodesh, but Va'aram is Kosov Aleim. The, the, the name on the tokens were written in Aramaic, and that is Egel is the same. But for example, in Lashon HaKodesh, an adult sheep, right, is called a ram, is called a zachar, and in Aramish, it's called a dachar. That will be the difference. Gedi is the same, and choyte is the same. But you had, according to Benazah, like we mentioned, a fifth one. So you had choyte dal, which is the mitzayra, and choyte asher, who would bring three karbanis. Now, each karban would need to have the one is sudden, because they were all young. They were all in the category of Gedi. And the three hin and the three leg of oil and three leg of wine, but there was a fourth one because the Mitzrayim needed the fourth leg. Now, eagle, the chaisim that had eagle, even though eagle means a calf, which is from the group of bakar, but a young one, it wasn't only for the eagle. Neshamish im nichse bakar, whether they were gadolim or katanim, even though a gadol is not called an eagle, it's called a para 
or called the shoyit. It doesn't matter. But the amount of nesachim does not change when it comes to cattle, whether they are old or young, nor does it change whether they are male and female. The choysim that has an gidi, that was mishamesh im nichsei hatsoin, even though here we, again, do not differentiate by the goat, whether the agadoyim or katanim, zucharim or kevois. The only standalone exception was a carbon that has to come back from an ayol, that ayol mishamesh im nichsei hoayelam bilvat. That only by the sheep, only if the sheep is an adult male, does it come along with this additional two esrein, like we said, not one and not three, three, three leg and three leg, but four leg and four leg. Mechaita, who is the chaita? Mishamish im nichsei sholosh behemois shel metzoidom. So in other words, the metzoidah that was wealthy, let's go with the wealthy one, he would have to bring three karbanes in the category of a gedi. But instead of him buying three tokens of Gedi. No, he bought one Chaita, and that came with all of the Nesachim that you need for each one of the three Karbanas, plus the extra log of oil. Now what happened? He would go to Yechanan that was in charge of the Chaisamites. The money was placed with Yechanan. Now we already know that Yechanan was the guy mentioned, but there was someone else involved over there. And he would receive this token. This then he would take the chosim to Achia, and he was in charge of the chamber that had all of the types of nesachims, meaning you had over there the flour and the oil and the wine. Then and he would give him the chosim, and he would get from him the nesachim equivalent to the name on the chosim. And Moerev in the evening, at the end of the day, boy and say it's alzeh yoichenon, right? Then Pinchas would come to Achia, and Achia might say they would they would they would switch it. And he would get the money from Yechanan. Now, what happens if when Achia had the tokens, but Yechanan did not have enough money, which means that Yechanan's group misplaced some of the money. They are responsible for it. In Pachasu, Pachasu loy, meaning the Shalom Yechanan mi But in the reverse, if for some reason there was extra money in Moisiru, it didn't stay with the family of Yechanan, but Isidu, it went to Hegdish as the rule. Sheyad Hegdish al ho al yoyna, the Beis Amigdash will always win. Now, Mish Ovid Chaysama, if an individual bought a Chaysim and they lost their Chaysim, and they're going now to, and they're telling Yechanan, listen, I paid you the money, I lost it. So they wouldn't right away believe him, but Mamtino they, Layadayr, they would wait until the day is at the end. And when this exchange would happen between Yechanan and Achia, the Ematsu Loi, if the exact amount of money corresponding to the chaisim that this Jew is claiming that he lost was in the hands of Yechanan, but Achia didn't have a token for it, that would take the Araya that the token was lost. Then Loi, but the Imla, but if it wasn't exactly that amount of money, even if there was a surplus, but not in that amount, then Loi Hoya Loi, and this Yid would have to buy again another chaisim. Now, what's to make sure that if I lose my chaisim, that you don't, you don't find it and use it, or someone, got forbid, can steal a chaisim, no one paid for it. So in order to make sure that there's no fraud, the shame hayoyim, that it, literally it means the day, the name of that weekday, we'll see more pratam in the Gemara, Kosov Aleim was written on the token, to prevent people from using chaisamas that they did not pay for. And indeed, that was the system by the Rebbe, right? When you got online, you had to get a chaisim, you got to, you got your ticket, and then with your ticket, you would be zoicha to have the bracha on the Rebbe's lulav. Says the Gemara, the first white line, that what are they arguing about? Uben Azai, choyte dal lama, he added a fourth token. Why do you need a fourth token? Really, the kasha is, being that the poor Mitzayda only brought one animal, the one animal is in the category of gedi, so the gedi is coming already with the one he saw in which he needed to bring, which was for the asham. And the three leg and the three leg of oil and of wine. Why was there a special one? Answer is because how you maybe luga imay because there is for the mitzvah this fourth leg of oil that was used in smearing it on his body parts, the ear, the thumb, and the toe, and that was something that according to Ben Azai, even an ani would not bring from his house. He would buy it in the base amigdash. So therefore, you needed to have a special token that had this unique additional leg of oil. However, the chachamim. They disagree with the Tanakama. They hold that the Ani who only had one animal for the Asham needed to have the token of Gedi 
for which you would get the one isada in a flower, the three leg of oil, the three leg of wine. I, he also needs another leg of oil. So nah, that leg of oil he brought from his house. You didn't need to buy it in the base amigdash. It was just more convenient. However, as we just learned a bit before, that whenever there was a price fluctuation, even though the temple always won, but when they would resell the oil, they would never resell it on the cheaper price that they paid for it. They would sell it for the current more expensive price. And there were times that you could have bought that day on the market cheaper oil. Now, obviously, we're not speaking about a huge price difference. And Tak and Usher, he's wealthy. He would buy it all in the base amigdash, not to be inconvenienced of getting oil. That's Tahar Vachule. But uh, the Chachamim held that the Ani was Tak is such an Ani that they would bring their own oil from their house. So all they needed to get was just a normal Nesachim that you need for a Gedi type of animal, which is one Isaran, three log of oil, three log of, of wine. And for that, the, the, the Gedi token was enough so you didn't, you did not need to have a not an additional special chaisim for the mitzvah ani. Now, nixay Rachel ma, a female adult shepsalem was what were the nesachim more like an ayol? No, Mahin. So the gemara says uh, 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 that um, ma min dochabol nixay rochel ma. Answers the Gemara min and it's like we learned in our Mishnah that the the that the gedi, which is really a goat, but the quantities for the gedi were good for a carbon that came as a rachel. The only difference in amounts was when it was a male adult ram. Nichsei, like it says clearly, nichsei tzayin, whether gedolim or ketanim, whether zecharim or nakevays, are all the same. So hada amni from here we know that nichsei rachel can nichsei gedi. And where do we get that from? Where did the Mishnah know it from? So recording the Pasik in Shlach, and everything will be learned from this Pasik. One category. So explains the Gemara, the second to last line. The word ho'echad, that's not going to teach you that when it comes to the oxen, there is no difference if the animal is in its first year, or whether it's coming from a larger animal, because you would have thought that Ben had soin to all nesachim, or Ben Abarker to nesachim, and therefore we would have said, "Mam im otzino." Since we do find shechilik that there is a difference in quantities, be nisrei kevesh. That if you're bringing a lamb within its first year, there is a lesser amount of nesachim. When you bring the same lamb, if it's called an ayol, from one is sudden to two is rain, from three to four, from three to four, daf tezvav. So therefore, you would think. We should make a difference in quantities. That's why the trader says, No, if it's in the category of cattle, then the Pasuk continues, Why do we have to separate ayol? But then you would have thought that since we found that you would think that since when it comes to the ayol, we do add, if it's within the year, that's called a kevesh or a kev, or kesev, then you bring uh, the smaller amount. The moment it hits uh, 14 months, then you bring a larger amount. One might have thought that what happens if this ram is in the third year, maybe you even have to add more. No, that not. Is lokach nachlik bein nischei nishin asayim, that's why the trader says also the word ha'echad by the ayol, that once it reached the maturity of an ayol, then it has the same amount, which is taka tuas reinim. It's four leg of oil, it's four leg of wine, but it never becomes more, even if the animal got older. Then when the final woman, it says, then you would think that since we find Lokach, we should make the same difference. And just like we have a difference in quantities when it's a male, the same thing should be by a female, Shepsalem, that may be within the first year, a lesser amount. But if it's a Rachel, that's the beginning of the sugya. If it's a you, it's called in English. In other words, it's a Shepsalem female within the second year. Maybe you have to add to a Sreinem, you have to give the, the four like, four like. That's why it says, Oy that it's the same thing. The difference is only when it comes to the Zohar by the Dachar and not by the Rachel. And finally, when it comes to the sheep, 
in the male, there is a difference. So you would think we should make a difference that by the goat, by the male, we should add more if you're bringing from an adult male goat. That's why it says, to tell you that and that explains the kids are the three types of categories, the cattle, the most, the one underneath it was the ayol, and then all other animals. If it's not in a male adult ram, there you brought for every animal that needed nesachim, the one is sudden, the three log of oil, which is a fourth of a hin, and the three log of, of wine. God willing to be continued. Did we start earlier today on something? Yeah, it was on the WhatsApp. What did we do? We started earlier because the day after Yom Tif, we have to catch up. So we did one daf. We just finished one daf. We started at 5 a.m.? started at 5 a.m. Oh, I, oh. I would have never believed. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Next, one second. Uh, Baruch, we're going to do it next week again. There's no option. That means next week, God willing, Monday morning, we're going to start at 5 a.m. Okay. Thank All you. Thank All you. right. So we are on Daf Tezvav. And Oigaval, this is not, it. not the whole week. We're not doing every double this whole week. We're doing the whole week, but only at six o'clock, mine, not at five. <clears throat> One a day. With the help of Hashem, we are learning Shkolim Daf Tez Vov, <clears throat> dedicating this class, Little Four Shalema to Matilda Basdara. We're going to be learning a little bit more about the tokens, about the Chaisamais that we used to purchase in the Beis Amigdas, through which we got later the animals, and we got the Nesachim for the animals, we got the tokens from Yechen and Tinchas. Then we would exchange it with Achia. We're going we're gonna to learn the details about the um, dating on the tokens, like the Mishnah wrote, that they, they wrote the day of the weekday for people not to be able, right, to use someone else's token or to gotcha but steal a token. We're going to clarify more about what the, how they dated these tokens. We're going to learn that in the Beis Hamikdash, there were two chambers. I can go again, Jaya. There were two chambers connected to giving tzedakah. We're going to learn about the importance of upholding the dignity of paupers, how to properly give tzedakah in a way where they feel the least amount of shame. We're going to actually have a Gavaldi Kasugia that when it comes to a building fund, building a shul, building a yeshiva, versus supporting yidin that are involved in learning, that supporting Jews that learn Torah is more important than building buildings for them. <clears throat> We're going to have an amazing story of Nachum Ishgamzu. We're going to learn on Daf Tezvav Amid Beis. We're going to start about the 13 shoifrois, the 13 a shoifer, like we already mentioned. Shoifer means a shoifer, or called a keren. It's what today you would call the pushka. There were certain chests in the Beis Amigdosh, and we'll learn a lot of details about what monies were put in which, in which one. And once we speak about the 13 chests, we're going to speak about other um, occurrences of 13 that happened in the Beis Amigdash, including that there were certain places where whenever you walked by that location, you needed to really bow down to Hashem. Not the way we bow down today in Shul, not even the way we bow down Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but we would fully prostrate ourselves on, on the ground, laying on our stomachs, extending our hands and our feet. And that's going to lead us, at least in the beginning of the topic, that there was a 14th area where people, certain people used to prostrate themselves. And that was above the tunnel that led to the chamber in which we hid the Aran HaKadosh. And that's going to open up at least the sugya of the Machlekes, whether there was one Aran HaKadosh, whether there were two Aranois, which one was placed where, what was one used for, what was the other one used for. Did the Goyim capture the Aran HaKadosh? Did it go to Babel and to Golos? Or was it hidden in the base of Migdash and much more? Let us start in the Tez Vav Amid Aleph. We left off 13 lines from the top of the Amid by the two dots. Referring back to the Mishnah, the Mishnah writes that on the Chaisamois, the Shem Hayoim Kasuf Boy, we wrote on it the, the, the Tajis, we wrote the weekday on it. Why? The Mishnah says, for people not to be able to embezzle, to steal a token and to use it. Asks the Gemara, Hagabatzmacha. Look at this expression. You know, consider, how does that help? Let's say a token was lost, the best case scenario, and someone took it and they didn't buy it. So it had a weekday, it had Monday on it. 
So what? So this guy will use it next Monday. Just writing a weekday on a token doesn't prevent people from using it improperly if they did not purchase it. Ah, the Gemara clarifies they didn't only put the weekday, but Shay Mishmar Hoya Kosovala, they also would write the name of the Mishmar of the group that is serving on that weekday. And as we know, that ultimately, beginning with dividing the Kahanim into eight groups, but ultimately we divided all of the Kahanim into 24 groups, and each group subsequently was divided into six. So there was the Bate Av, or in singular, the base Av of the Mishmar. But let's begin with the Mishmar. So every Mishmar served in the Holy Temple for one week. Beginning in middle of Shabbos, there was the change of guard by, by Musaf. And then they went until the next week, Shabbos. So it wasn't only that they wrote that this Chosem was from Monday, but they wrote the name of the Mishmar, which would mean, I mean, it solves the problem, but not fully. That if someone lost a token, if someone stole a token, they can't use it the next week, Monday. But really, the Mishmar is every 24 weeks, they, 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 they went through the whole cycle. So you would only be able to use it 24 weeks later, but that's not good enough. So again, the Gemara says, Hagaba consider If someone is making use of a chaisim that he or she did not purchase, so what that you had these two indicators, the, 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 the day of the week and the name of the Mishmar. So what every 24 weeks you would have the same name of the Mishmar on the same day of the week. Ah, the Gemara clarifies it was more details. It was shame hayoim. It was not only the weekday. But they also wrote Shem Shabbos. Interesting. They would write on the token what week meanings, how many weeks are we into the month? How amazing is that? And they would write the name of the month. All of that is a side of the day of the week and a side of the name of the Mishmar. Uh, that was something that I don't know that would repeat itself once in 200 years. If any, you know, that 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 that's secure. A feel writes a if someone is trying to match the token with the next upcoming date that will match all of these details, a matsui lazayeg. It's not gonna happen that quickly. And that's the way they made sure that the tokens of one day was only good for that day. Now, what happens if someone stole it on that day? That's the kasha. So all of this is only good. So you can't use it on a subsequent date, but you didn't protect any type of Ramayin for that very day. So the commentators say that if a chosim was lost or if someone had his chosim stolen, they made a whole ruckus. They made a tumult. So they knew to look out. They knew to look out for someone who might be coming with a chosim that he or she did not purchase. But if they would be able to use it in a later date, by then they would forget or it would be there would be an accumulation of lost chaisamais. By then it would be impossible to make sure to be that overly careful, making sure no one uses a chaisam that they did not themselves purchase. Moving on to the next Mishnah, Halacha Dalit, Mas Nisan. There were two additional chambers. We're not speaking about the chambers that we spoke until now. This is not speaking about the 13 shoifarais that we'll speak about on Ahmed Bey's, but there were two chambers of tzedakah. One of them was called lishkas hashoyin, which means the chamber of the discreet. This chamber was not like we learned in the last daf. You didn't have seal upon seal upon seal. It was a chamber that people had access to enter. And it was done purposefully so. Now, could people, God forbid, take advantage of that? Yes, they could. But there has to be one tzedakah fund that a poor person who would be embarrassed to take money from a fund, but would, but because of his or her need, if they have access to a physical room in which there is money, they would go there discreetly and remove what they need. So there was one chamber called the chamber of the discreet, and it was taka left opened. And when you put money in there, you knew that anyone can go and take it out. And it was designated for people that would be too embarrassed to take from a tzedakah fund. But here, since no one saw them going in or out, or better, when they went in there, no one knows whether you're going in there to place money, to donate money, whether you're going in there to remove money. So there was no shame absolutely involved. And the other one was called the chamber of the utensils. When people donated to the temple, Many times they brought a the utensil, so there was a special chamber for the utensils, as we'll see more details. Lishkas chas shoyim, the chamber of the discreet, explains the Mishnah. Yerei chet, people that have a special amount of uh, or of Hashem, they would noisnen letoicham b'chashoy. They would put money in there discreetly. In order, va'aniim b'nei toivim. B'nei toivim means that many people they come from wealthy families. 
they're not accustomed to receiving money from the community. They, they feel tremendous amount of shame. Most times, over time, you get used to it. You lose that shame. But in the beginning, it's called an Ani Bnei Toivim. And we have sugyas in Ksubis, by that if someone, because of his having a, 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 a upbringing of wealth, if they are accustomed to living a certain lifestyle, and God forbid, they now need help, we are never allowed to say, I don't have to support that lifestyle. All right, you need money, I'll buy you bread. You want to have meat? No, don't, you can live without meat. No, 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 no. If someone is accustomed to a certain lifestyle, the mitzvah of tzedakah is to keep them to up to help them upkeep that lifestyle. So they would especially be ashamed to take money from the tzedakah, from the normal tzedakah funds, because the normal tzedakah fund will only give them $1,000. And they need, for Pesach, they need $5,000. So that was that chamber for them. So Rabbi. Yes. This money is just regular tzedakah money, nothing to do with karbanas or anything that you need for the Beis HaMikdash? No, very good. Nothing to do with the Beis HaMikdash. And, and a regular Yisrael could go to this room yes. and somehow get money? It was an Ezra's Yisrael, 100%. And that's the best thing, because imagine if you have a location where all that location is forced to give tzedakah, whoever goes there will already feel shame, even if it looks like they're going to give. The Beis Amikdash was a happening place. It was done in a very public area. No one would know that you're going in there to take money from the Lishkas Hashoim. Lishkas HaKelim, a special chamber for for donations of utensils. I know here in Los Angeles, many times they have the they have these big um, they have these big um, pushkas for clothing. You put clothing in there, clothing fund, which is beautiful. That was for Kalem. Lishkas Kalem, call me Shumis Nadif Kalei. If you want to donate a Kalei, Zorka You would you would put it in that chamber. And Ba'achas Lishvay Shem Yoyim. Once in thirty days, Hagis Bodem Poichasin Poichin Oisa. They would open it up. And if in there there was a utensil that that utensil itself was needed, there was a hammer. You know, there was a keli that they used, and then when you, they would use it. However, all of the other utensils, they were sold. And the money went for temple upkeep. I know my mother told me this is beautiful. My mother's father, of blessed memory, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Mazes, was like many Yidin of his generation, they would gift big silver gifts. Remember, he brought for us a big koshel alio and the leichters, whenever he gave my mother a gift, and he gave gifts the whole time. It was big silver utensils, Judaica. Why silver? So he says that he was told by his family that Yidin should gift each other silver because the Beis HaMikdash is going to be built and we have to have what to bring to the Beis HaMikdash. Like this, if you own a lot of silver, you have what to give to God. What a beautiful thing. And Taka, there was a chamber for silver, a chamber for all Caleb. Right, next Gemara. Rabbi Yaakov Baridi and Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Nachman, they were Parnasim, they were communal leaders. And they would give to this Rav Chama a dinner. Now, as we'll notice, this collector, this Rav Chama, did not appear to be poor, but he would come and ask for money. And they would give him the money. But they understood why. Why was that? For who and add the Aleph, In other words, the poor people would be ashamed to go to Rabbi Yaakov Aridi because they knew Rabbi Yaakov Aridi, he's the one that distributes tzedakah. So in order to take away the shame of the pauper, they would give the money to Rav Chama. Rav Chama was not an official tzedakah administrator. And therefore, the poor man would have a lot less shame going to someone, no one knew he's going to get money. It could even be that when this Rab Chama came to Yaakov and Yitzchak Bar Nachman, they had no idea that the money that they're giving to him is really going to be passed on. They didn't know. He asked for money, they gave him money. And that's clearly in the next story. Rabbi Zechariah, the son-in-law of Rabbi Levi. People would gossip about him because this Zechariah would collect money from tzedakah funds. And people knew that Zechariah did not need it. And he didn't care. So people badmouthed him. But Omnin, and what, what was the laws? What was the rumor that the Lord said, yeah, this guy doesn't need money, but still, Bahanasiv he takes. And the whole life he lived with that cloud over his head. Min the Damach, when he passed away, you know what they discovered? Batkin the Ashkechin. 
that all of the money that he took was not for him. But the have a mafik him that he gave it out to others. He gave it out to others that had the shame to go to the tzedakah funds. So he didn't mind that they that they were might salas on his whole life. He made sure that certain aniyim, we call them aniyim, b'nei toivim, aniyim that are ashamed, should not have to undergo the shame of receiving money from tzedakah funds. Rabbi Chinana, Bar Papa, half a maflik, mitzvah balayli, he would give out money at night. Normally at night, you don't go out. Right, we just came off Psachim with all of the evil spirits that go out, hang out at night, all of the shadim. He would only give out money at night because as the Rambam, when the Rambam speaks about the eight levels of tzedakah, one Ideal in Sudaki is at least at least the recipient should not know who is the benefactor, because then when he'll see the benefactor, he won't feel the shame. So he might, you know, we have the story in I think it was in Ksuba, it's about Marukva, how he would put money under people's doors. Beautiful. He went out at night, and indeed he got into trouble with the spirit. Chadzman one time Pogebe Rava Hoim Deruchaya, the leader of the spirits, and it wasn't a good spirit. Met this uh, tzedakah distributor of and 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 the spirit was angry with him. Amalei loy kain ilfon. Did you not learn in the Torah where it says loy sasig rayecha? Don't encroach on the territory of the other. Night is the time for the ruches to hang out at night. You are encroaching in our territory. So to which he responded, Amalei loy kain ksiv. What does it not say? You're quoting a pasuk. I'll quote a pasuk. Matan b'seiser yichpa after people who know how to gift in a discreet way, that is what takes away God's anger. The ideal of tzedakah is to make sure that the recipient has the minimum amount of shame possible. And if that demands of me going out at night, so be it. The night is a time where there where are spirits. I don't care. I'm doing tzedakah in, in the right way. And when the when the spirit heard that, it was it, 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 it felt awe and respect of this rabkinana. The haba mistafe minei. He became afraid of him, and instead of him harming Rabbi Chinana Bar Papa, which he wanted, but for Arik Min Kamoi, he ran away from him. I think when we make the Siyumim, right, that's one of the Bar Papas, right? That's this Papa. They were very wealthy. They say that Papa always made a Siyum, which is, and he made a big meal, which is why we always mention him. And I'll pick up all of the ten sons, we correspond to the ten Sfidas. But here we have, at least from one of his children, the Midah Toiva of giving money in a way where the Ani doesn't know who gave the money. Amar Rabbi Yoyna. Ashrei Noisim Ladal Leng Siv. In Te'ilim, it doesn't say fortunate is the one who gives to the poor. It says Ashrei Maskil Eldo. Fortunate is the one by that contemplates. He's He puts thought, how can I give the money to the poor at this moment in a way where the poor will experience the least amount of shame? How to do it? And Kate said, How did Rabbi Yehuda do it himself? So again, the Ani who comes from a wealthy family, but now he became impoverished, and he would be a person that would be very uncomfortable receiving help from the tzedakah. Rabbi will tell him, I heard, I heard that you have that you inherited money. You don't know about it yet. I, I know that money is coming your way. So you know what? Now I know that you're going to pay me back. Here, take a loan. Toil, toil, take now and pay me back. Now, the truth is, the truth is, guys, I'm going to take a small break because I just noticed that my camera is not connected. And if the line falls, then we lose the class. But I'm going to connect it right now. All right, that did it. I apologize. The truth is, Rabbi Yoyna knew that this Jew has no money coming his way. But at least he received the money. Now, of course, if he can pay back, it's good. He never asked of him to pay back. But that's another way of, of helping a yid by telling him, I'm giving you a loan, I'm not giving you tzedakah. Min the Nasev, once this, this person received the money, Amalei, then he would tell him, listen, if you want, you can hold on to it. Matani Hilocha, another story. Chia bar Adam is have a beyoy meinun. There were elderly poor people that lived in his time. 
And man, the havi yahiv lohoin mi bein reishat elutzoy meraba. If you offered these elderly paupers money between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, then havi nasbin they would accept it. But min baser kain if you offered them money from after Yom Kippur until the next year Rosh Hashanah is loy havi nasbin they would never accept the tzedakah funds. Why? I mean, they would say the shat on gabon all of the money that was designated by Yom Kippur that we should be receiving during the year, we're going to receive. They felt that, <laughs> that if they won't take money from the tzedakah funds, God is going to make sure they get the money through another medium. So why should they take the money from the tzedakah funds? On the other hand, they felt that in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, then if they'll accept money from the tzedakah funds, that won't be deducted, so to say, from the amount that it was that's going to be decided for them to receive. All pointing out that these elders were very uncomfortable receiving money. And really, therefore, people who wanted to help them needed to have the maskil, the seichel, to make sure to get them the money, dafka, during that time of the year. Next story. Nechemia ish shichin. And as we learned in the previous daf, and here we're going to see, um, again, usvivav nisa'ara ma'oid, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's medagdek in tzadikim, kechut asayde, he was a very lofty yid, but for his level, he made a mistake. Now we're going to learn about a mistake that he made. And that is that Pogaboy Yerushalmi Yechot. There was a poor Yerushalmi that met him. And Amr Lei Zachei Imi. Yerushalmi is when they ask for tzedakah, they don't say, give me money. They, they, they tell the giver, you will get a schus by helping me out. In other words, he asked for help. But what help did he want? So this Yerushalmi tells him, give me money to buy a Tarnagolta, to buy a hen. And at that time, meat was cheaper than chickens, than hens. Hen was like a delicacy. So he asked from a tzedakah fund to get money for his delicacy. So Armale, so to which Nehemiah tells him, Halacha to me say the kupak. Now here's money to buy fat meat, to buy good meat. But a hen, if you need to get money from the tzedakah, right, al tegazem. All right. Now this Jew was an ani ben toivim. He was only accustomed to eating hens. But he only had money to get meat. So vizavin, he bought kupak. And he ate it, and because of him being a very finicky person, so he passed away. And whose failing was that? To a, to a high level, the failing of, of Nehemiah, who should have been more sensitive and not to tell him that the, you know this is you don't need all that money. If he asked for it, you should have you should have given it to him. And Bahabit yeah, Sedeh for I'm sorry. Nehemiah doesn't have control over life or. Yeah. I know, I know, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. This is just, um, we're not we're not judging him, we're judging him in a very positive way. In other words, the message for us is, is that if someone is asking for a certain type of help, it could be that they don't need it, but it could be that, that that's what they need. And uh, we have to be careful not to inquire too much. Some people only make a due diligence. If a guy is asking for money, give him the money. That's the message over here. I have a tzavach for, uh, for tzedakah. I have a tzavach for Amar. Boyu v'siptoi. And he himself said, let's go eulogize to the person who was killed by Mechemi. In other words, he took his own responsibility for that terrible tragedy. And again, that's the Gemara and Ksubis, right? That they machseiroi ashe yechsa loi. In other words, it's not that if you need money from tzedakah, that's all you get. No. If someone is an ani ben toivim, then the mitzvah is to afford that person a continuity of his or her lifestyle. Nachum ish gamzu. This is a very tragic story. He was once taking a gift to his father-in-law and and he encountered someone who was a, who was a mukashchin. He had body sores and boils. And Amarle, and again, this mukashchin tells Nachum Zakei Imi, why don't you merit Olam Haba by helping me? You have a whole wagon full of stuff. Please share some of it with me. And as the Tiklin explains, that Nochum did not see, did not think that that person was in dire need. And therefore, since he was involved in the, in the mitzvah of honoring his father-in-law, he felt, first, I'm going to give the gift to my father-in-law. And I know my father-in-law is not going to take it all. It will be leftovers. And then I'll bring the leftovers to this, Mukashchin. Amalei, that Mechazoid, on my way back, I'll help you. What happened was, by the time he got back, this person passed away. Chazar. When he returned, the Ashkechemis and Vahava Omar Likivle, so Nachum Ishgamzu faced that deceased body. And he said regarding himself, 
that a naya the chamina that the eyes that looked at you and didn't immediately give you is yistamion. These eyes should become blinded. Yidei the hands the leipashtan that did not extend the leipashtan made the that did not extend themselves to help you. God forbid these yiskatun should be cut off. Raglaya the feet the leirahatun the made that wasn't running to help you is yitavron should break. And you know what says the Gemara umatase kain and all of these statements had happened to Nachamish Gamzu. And furthermore, Solik Lagabe Rabakiva, Rabakiva was a student of Nachamish Gamzu. And when he saw his teacher in such terrible condition, physical condition, Omar Lay, Rabakiva tells his teacher, Eli, Eli is oily, Sha'ani Roy Oisa Bekach, that the oil that I see you in such suffering. So Omar Lay, to which Nachamish Gamzu tells Rabakiva, Eli, Sha'ani Roy Oisa Bekach, woe to me if I won't see you like this. So Amalei, oy gewalt mata mekalalani, why are you cursing me? Amalei, to which Nachumish Gamzu tells the student to ma'at mevayid bisudim, why are you burning afflictions? Oy li, no, Nachum felt that it's good for me to undergo these yisudim as an atonement for, again, compared to the standard that he held himself by, that he didn't immediately help that person when that person asked for help. Baitet. Rab Hoishaya, Rab, the great Rab Hoishaya, Hoishaya, have Rabbi Divrei Chad Sagi Nohoiro. One of his son's teachers was a blind man, and now we're going to see the wisdom and the sensitivity that Rabbi Hoishaya Rabbi had to this blind teacher. What was that? That the Havi Yolif Echol Imei Bechol Yaimo. That Rabbi Hoishaya Rabbi would eat with the son's teacher every day to make sure that he has covered. A blind person could be looked down at, can be a little bit of an outcast. He was machabed him by eating with him every day. Chadzman, one time, Havalei Orchen Rab Hoishaya Rabbah had guests. And therefore, that day, he didn't go and eat with the blind man. The blind man didn't know why. So what happened was, is Beramsha in the evening, Solik Legabe, Rabbi Hoishaya Rabbah didn't wait until the next day. He went that evening. And Amalei, and he tells this blind man that, Lo yichos marai olai, Master, don't be upset at me. Begin the Havali Archen Yamadin. Since I had guests with me. And the Omrin, and I said to myself, or the Omris, that the Loy Levaze be Yikara, the Mari Yoimadain. I felt that my guests might not give you the right amount of honor. They might look down at you. They might discriminate against you. So I didn't want to bring anyone that might not treat you with your due honor. So therefore I didn't come to you to begin with. It's begin came. That's why Loy Achlis in Mari Yoimadain. But, but I'm here now just to let you know that I'm coming back tomorrow. And those words brought a tremendous amount of consolement and it uplifted and it appeased this blind person. Imagine not only did Rabbi Yishaya honor him every day, but when he missed one day, he went to justify it, to excuse himself. So Amalei, so this blind teacher told Rabbi Yishaya Rabbi that Ata Peyasta, that you appeased Laman de Meschame to someone who could be seen, but Voloichame, but that can't see. You had that amount of sensitivity, so he gave him a bracha. So then, therefore, that the chamei, the loy mischamei, the one who sees but cannot be seen, who is the one that sees but cannot be seen? That's God Almighty. Yekabel piyusa Hashem should always accept your appeasement. Whenever you need something, you need to be appeased. May God appease you as you did to me. And he found that statement very clever. He says, Amalei habami nolach, where did you hear such a statement? calling out to God, the one who sees but cannot be seen, in reference to you, to the opposite. So Amalei, I heard it from Rabbi Yezeb ben Yaakov, that Rabbi Yezeb ben Yaakov, oil chad, the sagi nehoira lekarte, there was once a blind man that moved into the city. And these were people that were normally not treated with that much respect. And Rabbi Yezeb ben Yaakov wanted to make sure that everyone honors him. And he was poor, honoring meaning everyone should give him tzedakah. So Yosef laid up Yosef and Yaakov l'ramine. He sat l'ral. L'ral means to bed, which means that then wherever they were eating, Rabbi Yosef and Yaakov didn't only come near this poor man, but he sat in a seat that made it look. He was like under the the blind man. It, when someone looked at them together, it would appear from the way they were seated that this blind man was even more chashuv than Rabbi Yosef and Yaakov, which inspired everyone to help him out a lot with tzedakah. 
the yain room for people to say that the ilule dahaba banosha rabba, that if not for this blind man being a great person, then lo yosulay rabbi yezab ben yakov l'ramini, rabbi yezab ben yakov would not see beneath him. You know, it's he positioned himself where it looked like this ani was someone very chashev, and he was not, but he was someone that was blind. He needed more help than others. And because of that, of the lay parnasa di yikar, that the parnasa, the, the tzedakah, the money that people gave, who they gave him a lot of money. He got a lot of tzedakah. He never collected that much money. So Amar loin, man hachin. How did this happen? Who 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 painted me in such a bright light? So Amar um, so they told him, Rabbi Yezid ben Yaakov came here. He didn't say anything to anyone. He simply sat, he sat in a place that was beneath yours. So when that blind man heard what Rabbi Yezid ben Yaakov did to him, so v'tzaloi, Aloy Hadot Salusa. So he prayed for Rabbi Yezer ben Yaakov the following prayer that Ata Gamalta Chesed, you bestowed kindness, Laman de Meschame Veloichame, to a person who is seen but cannot see. I'm blind. That's why, Dain, so it should be that the Chame, the Loy Meschame, that the one that sees but cannot be seen, God Almighty, Yigmoel Yosach Chesed, should always bestow kindness upon you. Beautiful. Next, three lines before the bottom of the Amit. Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina and Rabbi Oishia, or Rabbi Oishia Rabbi. Rabbi Matayla, they were strolling, they were walking. Be'ilain Kenishna, the Lord, amongst, it was like the street where all of the big synagogues was built in Lod. So Omar, Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina, to Rabbi Oishia, Kama Mama in Shiku Avoisaykan, look how much money my forefathers invested in these shuls. You know, my family built these shuls. And he thought that he'll get a big Yashukaya. But Rabbi Shaya, the great response to Rabbi Chama, Omar Lein, Kama Nefashois, Shiku Avisechakan. How many souls did your parents bury in these buildings? Meaning that funds are always limited, and there were people in Lloyd that were great scholars, people that should have been supported, and they did not, they were not supported because those funds were used to build a building. And Rabbi Shaya Rabbi was of the opinion that even more important than building a beautiful shul is giving money to Yidin that are sitting and learning. Lehava bin Nosh were the no people, the Leoin, the Arisa that were toiling in Tairam, and they were not supported by your family. The money was used for the building. So they Mistama stopped learning. They went, they, they, they stopped their occupation of learning. And that was a mistake. And similarly, Rabbi Avoin, Avad Elaine Tarayo, that there was a big, uh, there, there, there was a building, there was a, an, a yeshiva, and he built big gates, the Sidra Rabbah for the Great Academy. Asa Ravmana Legabe, Ravmana came to him in Amar Lane, he tells Ravmana, Chami my Avad, take a look what I did. I built beautiful uh, doors, gates, entranceways for the, for the, for the yeshiva. So Amar Lane, Ravmana tells him, he quoted the Pasuk in Oishaya. Now that Pasuk is speaking about Yidin in the past that they abandoned God and they went to idol worship. And it says, Vayishkach Yisrael Esoiseu, that the Jewish people forgot their maker, which is Hashem. And what did they do? Vayiven Hecholos, and they built Hecholos. They built a Hechol, meaning they built houses for idol worship. That's the Pshat. The Drush is, is that you forget God, your maker, if all of the money goes into a building instead of supporting people that are diligently learning Torah, that we have a Beinash, where there are no people here, Dili Oin, the Arisa, that are toiling in Torah, and they should have taken precedence. Now, coming back to our Mishnah, the Mishnah spoke about the second chamber. The second chamber was the chamber in which they put the utensils, and the ones that they did not need, those utensils were sold, and what? And the money was used, and the money was used for... That the Kabayis asks the Gemara, hold on, I have a problem. We learned in Abraisa that Kachim is Bayach, that the funds that were needed to buy Karbanis for the Mizbeach, if they ran out of funds, where did they get money from? That monies that were donated for temple upkeep are allowed to then be used for the altar, for the Mizbeach. However, the Braisa says, not the other way around, that ain't kachay better kabayis, moitzina seroi lahen, be kachay misbech. That if you have to have more funds for temple upkeep, and that account is right now depleted, you may not dip into the kachay misbech one. In other words, the concept of mylon bakoydesh, 
You can only go up in holiness and you're not allowed to go down. Kachay Mizbeach is considered holier, more important. So it can go in that direction only. The problem is, in our Mishnah, it says, asks the Gemara of Ohatanin, and it says in our Mishnah, that play that the utensils that they themselves were needed, then Manichanoi said that was Hakel left, it was not sold. But all the other utensils, them cut him. And what does the Mishnah say? With the name like from the Kabayis, the Mishnah doesn't say that their money was used for the Mizbeach. But here in the Braisa, we're saying that money from the Bedek Abayas funds can sometimes go for the Mizbeach. Why did the Mishnah not mention it? So the Lord says, that's not a kasha. Omer Ab No, that Kene Masnisin. The Mishnah is good. The money was put into the Bedek Abayas fund. It lechatchila doesn't go into the Mizbeach fund. People that donated Kalim knew this is for temple upkeep, either by the use of the keli themselves or by selling it and using the funds for any temple upkeep need. Yes, if they ran out of money in the fund for the mezbeach, then they would take they would take those funds from the bedekabayis fund. But 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 lechatchila people that donated money for the bedekabayis, you don't lechatchila put that money in kachim mezbeach. It goes into the lishkas bedekabayis. And on this we say, Hadran Allah, we will return to you. Peluk, Elu, Haim, Amamunim. And now we are starting with the sixth chapter that's going to be speaking about that outside in the Azara, not a chamber, but outside there were 13 shaifarais, there were 13 chests, there were 13 pushkas for various needs as we will enumerate them all in this period. Says the mission. Allah Al, Mas Nisan, Shloisha, Asur Shaifaris. There were 13 collecting chests. And since the Mishnah mentions the number 13, as we just learned, by right, Ezra has seifer or the seifrim, and Torah was learned by heart and as, an, as a mnemonic, as a help for memory, we have many other 13s listed altogether. Shloisha, Asr, Shulchan, there were 13 tables. And we're going to go through the 13 of them that were used in the Beis Amigdash. Similarly, what other what what else do we have in number thirteen? There were thirteen places in which, whenever you walk by that place, you would have to fully prostrate yourselves in front of Hashem whenever you pass by. How much? Thirteen. Adds the Mishnah shall base Rabban Gamliel as we shall base Rabbi Hanan Yaskana Kehanim. There was a 14th place that they added, and whenever you walk by that location, you would buy down, you would bow down. Now says the Mishnah of Hechen Hoysayasado, where was this additional 14th place? Opposite where they would have the chamber where they stored the wood. Well, it's good to know, as we have in the Sugya of Gitin by Kamsa Bar Kamsa, that the amount of fuel that was needed for the Mizbeach was humongous, was tremendous. And there was a huge chamber where they stored the wood. And somewhere around there is where they would bow down. Why? Because she came, the Sweetest, the Yodin Because these families of Beis Rabban Gamliel and the family of Beis Hananya, they had a tradition. Shesham Ha'orain Nignas, that there is where the Orain was hidden. And as the Ramam writes in more details, we have the sugya also in Hodiyas, Daf Yud Aleph, Daf Yud Beis, that when Shleim HaMelech built the Beis HaMikdash, the first temple, he foresaw with his Chachma that the temple will be destroyed. And he right away built underground, secretive, hidden tunnels that leads to a chamber that was meant to hide and to place the Holy Ark with other holy items, as we'll learn in tomorrow's Daf, until the coming of Mashiach. Who actually put the Oren there? King Yoishio. Now, as we will see over here, in our Mishnah, there's only one opinion, that that is where the Oren was sitting. But as we'll begin to unpackage this sugya, let's just speak this out right now. When God Almighty told Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was told that he's getting the Luchais, Hashem told Moshe to build a Oren in which to place it. Don't forget, my friends, that the Mishkan was built a long time later. Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain when we know the story and all of the tragedies, right? So the Yud Zayin be Tamil is Nishtabra Haluchais, and if not for Nishtabra Haluchais, and even after the Luchais were broken, where did they put those fragments? Don't forget that Betzalel was the one in charge of building the Mishkan, including the Klei Kodesh, including the Aran HaKodesh. 
but that was built much later. So we have what we will call the Aden of Moshe, which was a wooden Aden, Kaidish, and we have the Aden of Betzalel. And that information is very helpful when it comes to learning this topic. Because in our Mishnah, we only have one opinion, that the Aden was hidden, and everyone knows it was by through King Yoshio, where, so the entrance way that leads to the secret tunnels, into the secret chamber, is, is exactly opposite where the wood chamber was, where the Lishkas Asim was. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean that the chamber itself is right under the ground. There are those that say that the entrance to the tunnel was against, was opposite, was adjacent to the Lishkas Asim. It could be that the tunnel goes to a faraway place. All of that could be. But the way to get to the Aram Kodesh is by going to Harabayas, and going down right near the Lishkas or Eitzim. And Maisa B'Kayin Echa, the Mishnah says a story. Shohei Mesasek, that he was busying himself, or Mesasek means that he was not busy doing the Avoid. He was just, you know, walking around near that area, near the wood chamber. And he realized, Vira Saritzba, and when he looked at the floor, he noticed, Shohei Meshunah Mechavre said, that one tile is not exactly aligned with the others. He realized that this tile can be lifted and Bob and he went to tell his colleague where the tile is because he understood that if you lift that tile, that will lead you to a tunnel that would lead to someplace important. But we were not meant to know then where the tunnel is and where to find the Aron Hakodesh and Lehispik Ligman Asadavar. And before he had a time to tell to share the news where he found the entrance to the tunnel, he right away passed away. And that, and because of his passing, Viyadu Biyichud. Now, he never said where it is, but he told us, Chabad, I found the secret tunnel entrance. So they knew for sure, Shesham Ha'orein Gonus. And that substantiated the Mesoides of Beis Rabbi Gamliel and Beis Rabbi Hanan Yuskanaka. And therefore, any time a Yid walked by that area, they would bow down over there because they're walking at least by the entry to the tunnel that leads to the Aron HaKodesh. And as the Rebbe explains, something beautiful, that the Kedush of the Beis Hamikdash originates from the from the Kodesh HaKadshim. And, and, and as we know, that the Jew corresponds to the Beis HaMikdash. And there are many levels to our Neshama. And as we also know, that the deepest level of our Neshama, the Yechidah Sheba Nefesh, is always intact. It never gets tainted. It can certainly never get destroyed. And corresponding to that is a underneath chamber in the Beis HaMikdash that was never found by the Goyim and it was never destroyed. So during the times of the first Beis HaMikdash, up until almost the end, up until the times of King Yoshio, so that Gilu Yelikos was in the world. So therefore, the Aron HaKadosh was in the revealed part of the Kadosh Kachin. Even though a Churban was coming, and in the external part of the Beis HaMikdash, there was going to be a, 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 a cutoff, there was going to be a blemish, but it can never affect the core. And furthermore, the Rebbe says that this chamber that Shleim HaMelech built that is part of the Beis Hamikdash. It's not a secondary chamber. That is the Holy of Holies, which means that the Beis Hamikdash, at its core, was never destroyed, can never be destroyed. Elama Golos means that it's buried underground. It's hidden, which is the story of the Jew. Says the Gemara Abraisa regarding the thirteen chests that Hashayfaris Halalu. That why were they called the Shayfar? Because they were Akumais Hayu. They were curved. Curved means that Saris Milamalon, they were narrow on the top, and Rechavis Milmaton, and they were broad in the bottom. Why is that? Because people that might pretend to be putting something in, and if you can remove something with ease, then you'll actually take and not give. Contrast this with the previous Mishnah that we learned that there was Takelishkas HaChashoyin. It's not a stira. There has to be a place for Hashoyin. Now, can you prevent Ramoyim from going there? No, you cannot. And a Hanami, there's a risk. The Satmar Rebbe said that he gave tzedakah to so many people that at least once he gave tzedakah. But he wasn't naive. Whoever asked him, he gave. He knew there can be many Ramoyim. Fine. But there, here in these 13 uh, in these thirteen chests, you can only put in, you can't take out. Now, by the Tony, we learned in the name of Rabbi Eliezer that the Oroin, not like it says in our Mishnah, that the Oroin was, was Nignaz somewheres 
near the uh, the place of the Beis Hamikdash, but Ha'arin Golo Imoim Lubavel, that Ha'arin was taken in captivity to Babel. And my Tamo, as it says in Malachim, that Velo Yivaseid Dover, that nothing will be left. Amad Hashem, God says. Now Dover, what does Dover allude to? Dibrois, amazing. Ain Dover, Eloshad Dibrois Lotoichoi, Lo Yivaseid Dover. They won't be, we, we, won't, we won't stay with the Dibrais. They went into exile. The Chenu and as it says in another Pasik, that this, this was said by Nebuchadnezzar, when he went and he took Yechonia into Golos, because he took us into Golos in phases. Ulis at the turn of the year, Sholach HaMelech Nebuchadnezzar, to bring, to bring the king, our king then, to Babel, with Im Klei Chemdas Beis Hashem, with the precious Kalim of the house of God. Now what, what did that allude to? Ah, that is the Oroin. And indeed, so that's one opinion. Now, either the next statement is by Rab Shimon ben Lakish, which is difficult because we're learning here Rab Raisa, right? Tani Rab Eliezer. So that's what we have in the parentheses that Rab Yehuda ben Rab Eloi or Rab Shimon ben Lakish says, no, the Oroin was not taken into bubble. The Mekoi Moi Nignos. I, no, it was hidden in in in, in Yerushalayim. It was hidden. It was hidden in in the place in the hidden base of Migdash. And as it says, he quotes a pasuk in Malachim where it says, habadim, that the staffs that were inside the Aron Kodesh were made long, and therefore Vayiru Rashi Habadim Al Kodesh. If you stood on the Kodesh, you were able to see the heads of the staffs El Pnei Adivir facing the inner chamber. But but you were unable to see it outside. You saw it, but you didn't see it. And actually, as the Gra adds over here, the Pasik continues that Vayyusham Ad Hayoyim Hazet. That's his proof. And they are there until today. So that's a Rayad know that the Arana Kaidish is there when Ad Hayoyim Hazet. Now, was it seen or was it not seen? It says Vayiro that if you were inside the Hechel, you would see the tips of the bottom. But it says in the same Pasik, Voloyero. What does that mean? So explains the Gemara, El Niroim Niroim. Yes, it was seen, but it was not seen. Because both in the Yoitzim Kishne Dade Isho, these two staffs in the Zman Bayesheni, there wasn't the Amatraklin, there was the two curtains. And the staffs, they went inside the curtain. So if you were standing in the Hechel, you would see a little bit of a protrusion of both of the staffs. So you saw a, 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 a mark of the Aron HaKodesh, but no one even saw the staffs themselves because they were fully covered by the curtain. Now, the Rabban Anamini, another uh, uh, expounding on the Shita of Rabbi Yehuda Bariloi or Rabbi Shimon Melakish, that it, it stayed in Eretz Yisrael, it stayed in the Beis Hamikdash. Why does it mean it stayed there? It was hidden, but there, that Belishka's Diro ate some Hayo Ganos. And here we have another version of the story we had in the Mishnah. Maisa B'Kayin Echad Balmum. There was once, not a Masasik, but a coin who was not allowed to do direct avoida, but he was allowed to make sure that preliminaries are done by a coin, including making sure that the wood that's used on the Mizbeach has no worms in them. So I show you, he was peeling, he was deworming the wood as needs to be done. And while he's doing his work, but oh, I said, it's when he looked at the floor. Shehi mishtano mechaberei seo, that one tile was not aligned with the other ones, and Baba Amar lechaveira, and he wanted to, to tell his friend, boy, you hey, come and see, I said, it's vazois, this floor, shehi mishtano mechaberei seo, look, something is off on the floor, there's something here, and le hispik ligman asadavad, achi yatasana shmasoi, and therefore, v'yadu v'yichod, shesham ha'orin gonus. And so we have a machloikis. Bechlal, we try to avoid having a machloikis in Metzias. But on top of that, we have a story, so how do you explain the sheet of Rabbi Eliezer that the Aaron went into bubble and he has no verse that lo yivas says The story, the story huh? doesn't prove anything. It's just a story that the guy passed away. It doesn't mean that... No, 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 no. The Rabbi Eliezer that says that lo yivas says dover. Uh, no, the story is a proof, Danny. The story is a proof. So we're going to see over here, that's the hemshach of the sugi here, that there are two aroinos. We'll see details about it. So it's not a stira. One stayed there, and one and and one went to Babel. So Tony, we learned that another detail that Rabbi Oishia says that this coin Adarab, not that he was sharing the information with his colleague. No, the opposite. That tile was left a little bit different. So the moment Mashiach comes, we'll be able to right away go and, and retrieve it. You know what this coin wanted to do? 
Hikish Aleho Bikurmes. He wanted to knock it into its place. He meant well. He wanted to align it. He wanted to make sure that no one finds it. That's why he was punished. And the Yatasa'is Usarafatoi. And a fire came out and burnt him. So that tile, so to say, in other words, the way that we can make our ways into the Yechidah Shavan Nefesh is not sealed even during Golos. It might be more difficult, but it's not fully closed off. Time to be alert. And here you have again Rabbi Yehuda Bariloi. Or here, yeah, yeah, no, here you have Rabbi Yehuda, look at this, Ben Lakish. No, it's, before we had either Rabbi Yehuda Bariloi or Rabbi Shem Ben Lakish. So he says like this, that days Aroinois Hoya Mahalchem Yisrael Bamidbar, that there were two Aroinois. And like, every, listen, there's no, there's no debating. Moshe made an Aron of wood. But Salo made what we call the Aron HaKoydish, right? The three boxes, as it says in the Chumash, right? The gold and the wood and the gold with the Kapoidus. The question is, and another detail, when Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchais, it was placed in his Aron. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down again on Yom Kippur with the, with the wholesome Luchais, it was placed in the Aron of Moshe. You can't debate that. Then when B'Tzalel built the Aron HaKadosh, what happened then? This is the Machloikas. Two options. Option number one is everything was moved to the Aron of B'Tzalel. And that's I mean. There was one Aron. There was only one Aron. Or we only moved the wholesome Luchais to the Aron of B'Tzalel. And Moshe Rabbeinu's Aron had in it the Shivrei Luchais. So we are familiar. I mean, we learn Chitas. We, we learn always the opinion that Shivrei Luchais were together with the Luchais, together with the Sefer Torah, as we have in Baba Basra, that Surya. But here we learn the Machlaikas. So one opinion is that there were two Aroinus. Echot Shehoya Hat Torah Nesuna B'Toychoy. Again, the Gra brings the version that Echot Shehoya Soha Luchais Nesuna is B'Toychoy. And that is the Aron of B'Tzalel. And that is the wholesome Luchais. And that is also the Sefer Torah the 13th one that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote that he did not give to the tribes that stayed in the Aron Kodesh and there's a Machlekes Tanoim in Bavli, whether it was inside the Aron HaKodesh or whether they made a golden shelf mamish on the side of the Aron HaKodesh, but that's all together. And Be'echad or Ba'achad, that refers back to the one that Moshe Rabbeinu made, that the Shuvrei Lukas were kept separately. The Aron of B'tzalel always stayed in the oil moit. And on that, the Pasuk says, That's the story that after the Meraglim, and after there was the Gzeda to stay in the Midbar for 40 years, so you had what we call the Mapilim, you had those who were who were defiant, and they attempted to go to Eretz Yisrael, and they began a battle that they got complete. They we lost this battle horribly. But it says that when, when they went out to battle, that the Arim and Moshe did not go with them. Now, if the Arim would have always gone out in battle and they would not have gotten the Arim, they never themselves would have done it. The fact that they had the courage, which was a wrong courage, to go and to start battling, to go into Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because they didn't feel that there's an anomaly here. Because, course, because they followed the Shita that the Arim never went out in battle. And only that was the one that was Nichnas Iman. So when you do read about times that the Aron was taken into battle, what does that refer to? That was only the Aron of Moshe Rabbeinu. And not only did it go out to battle, but sometimes it stayed with the officers and the foot soldiers did not see it. But sometimes the foot soldier, that they, they would actually see the Aron that was made by Moshe that had the Shivrei Luchais. And how meaningful is that according to the Shita? You think about it. Mo Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest. And in the Aron of Moshe, there's the Shivrei Luchais. So you have the wholesome Jews, but Salal is Makar of them. Wh whose Koyach do we have to connect to Yidin that are, that, are, that are right now, they appear to be broken? Moshe Rabbeinu. And another thing, that Moshe Rabbeinu was the one that didn't wait for the Jew to come to the temple. But Saul had the Aron in the temple. You want to you get close to God, you go to the Oil Moyet. You go to the Mishkan, you go to the Beis Amigdash. Moshe Rabbeinu is the one that brings his Aron out to the Eden. Beautiful. That's one opinion. However, the Rabban and Omri, the Rabban disagree with that. And they hold that Aron Echad Hoyo. Emes, Moshe Rabbeinu made an Aron. True. But from when we built 
the Mishkan, and when we placed the both the Luchais and the Shivrei Luchais were both placed in the Aron of Betzalel, the Aron of Moshe is empty and it was hidden somewhere. Upamachas, it did. We, and when we went to battle, we never took the Luchais nor the Shivrei Luchais with us. We only did it one time. Upamachas, Eli, and that's the story where the Pelishtim captured the Aron, and that was an, that was that was a Chiddush. And that and according to him, that, that was because we were not allowed to take it out. And the Gemara is going to bring Psukim to substantiate each of these two opinions. But we'll stop over here and we're going to bring Psukim that proved this way, that they proved that way. And Lechoyda, the connection is now you understand why we have a Machloikas. So when you have something that an Aran was taken to bubble, Lechoyda, it's Mestama, this Aran. It's the Aran that didn't have the Luchais. It was Mestama, the empty Aran. And the Aden that our Mishnah is speaking about, the Aden that stays in Eretz Yisrael, it stays in Yerushalayim. And the way the Rebbe explains, it never left the base Hamigdash. It never left the Kotche Kotchim. It went into the hidden Kotche Kotchim. That's the Aden Kodesh that Salol made. That we're going to go with the sheet of the Rabbanon, Das Rabbim, that has in it the Luchais and the Shivrei Luchais and the Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote a lot more to be continued. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. that, that's Rabbanon, is that that's the that's the Oren that got captured by the Plishtim? And that Oren, that was the Oren that got captured by the Plishtim. Imagine. So we had a, but, but so how did it get captured? We, it would, it would go out to war? Because one, time, one to time we decided to take it out and we were not allowed to do that and they and the going uh, got, got it. With the, with the whole arichos of the Sipur there. They were punished. Right, right. They get back. Right. Have a good night, everyone. A good night. Tomorrow morning at 6, the normal time at 6.